Praise God. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. <clears throat> Let's get into our Bible lesson today. Psalms 23. Y'all probably never heard that Psalms before. Today's lesson is about the Lord is our shepherd. When you say the Lord is my shepherd, you know what you're calling yourself? Sheep. And only sheep are going to heaven. Amen. And the Lord in a proverbial way divided humanity into two groups, sheep and goats. Goats go their own way. Goats buck every boundary. But sheep don't. Goats are dumb and sheep are dumb. But it, one thing the sheep is smart enough to do is to follow the shepherd. And we need a shepherd because we're dumb. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> but th thanks be to God that he is our good shepherd. Psalms 23, 1 through 6 this morning. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need or I shall not want. In other words, if I got God, that's all I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the valley of death, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love or mercy will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. The truth about God today is that he is a shepherd. And he only shepherds those that willingly follow. But even sheep can stray away accidentally. Now, goats don't stray away accidentally. Goats want to get away. The prodigal son wasn't a lost sheep. He was a goat. He wanted to leave the father's house. So there is a difference. Be kind and pray for everybody and love everybody. But understand, if you go chasing the goat, you're not going to help them. They got to become a sheep before the Lord will be able to call them home. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 this morning. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. Uh, 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 50, 53, Isaiah 53 verse 6. There we go. All of us. Tell your neighbor that's talking about you. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We've left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. Finally, Matthew 25, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. We're all like sheep. We've strayed away. Through the sin of Adam, we got lost. And the Lord, like a good shepherd, has hunted us down. And called us back into the fold. Matthew 25, verse 31 through 34. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left hand, finally, verse 34, then the king will say to those on the right, that's the sheep, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I don't know about you, but I might be a dumb sheep, but Lord, I don't want to be a goat. Amen? Because the goat thinks he don't need a shepherd. The sheep usually are smart enough to realize we better hang around the shepherd because without the shepherd we are defenseless understand the lion and the bear can kill a goat as easily as they can kill a sheep 
But hopefully the sheep are smart enough to be around a shepherd who will protect them. Goats usually go their own way. Sheep are defenseless and they need a shepherd. But goats will not follow. They'll do their own thing. You build a fence for a goat, he'll chew his way out. He'll, he'll eat anything you make it out of to try to get out. That's why the world hates church, at least biblical church. They don't want no boundaries. They want heaven without any boundaries. They want the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, and they still want to go to heaven. They want heaven without holiness. But my Bible says without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Amen. Whatever holiness is, and it's got a lot of facets, God, help me to want it. Amen. Because without it, I can't make heaven my home. And there's some biblical holiness to where we need. There's some church holiness we need. There's some lifestyle holiness that we need. But a lot of holiness is us building barriers because the Holy Ghost has impressed upon us. Don't do that anymore. Don't go there anymore. Don't say that anymore. Stay away from that. A whole lot of holiness has to do with you building barriers in your life that says, I won't cross that anymore. And don't ever mistake holiness for what you do everybody else has to do. There's some holiness that's personal. It might not affect somebody else, but it might affect you. And God will say, you better stay away from that. That's going to trip you up if you keep going back there. But a good shepherd will help the sheep to make the right decisions and build barriers in their life. That's what that rod and that staff are for. Pull them back over here. The story of the lost sheep in the Bible that sheep didn't want to be lost. That's why the good shepherd left the 90 and 9 and went after the sheep. Because sheep don't want to be lost. He's out there accidentally straight away. Somehow or another, he got behind a tree or behind a crevice or behind a rock. And the shepherd didn't realize when they moved on and left that sheep. And there he was. And he found himself on the side of a cliff. Buying for help. Wanting help. But he didn't know how to get himself out of it. And the shepherd went to look for him. But you won't find that kind of story for a goat. When the prodigal son left, the father never went after him. He loved him. He wanted him, but he didn't go looking for him. Because often, brothers and sisters, when prodigals leave, they know the way home. But the devil tries to convince them the father don't want them back. It's just not true. The father wants them home. I don't care what they've got addicted to or what they've done or what they've snorted or what they drank or who they married or how long they've been doing it or how bad the situation is. I got a God who loves mercy. He wants them to come home. Somebody say praise the Lord or oh me. But hopefully they're sheep. Who found themselves straight away. Because goats, you can't lead them back. They, they'll fight their way through. And when people leave because there's just too many rules and regulations, it's all right. You're not going to pin them up anyway. Something had startled the shepherd awake. He jumped to his feet from his pack on the ground where he had slept with the sheep, where he had stayed with the sheep. And she, shepherds would often stay with their sheep all night long to protect them in the dark hours of the night. At the edge of the flock, he saw a few she, she, sheep stirring more than the others. Notice they're on the edge. If you're going to live for God, you better get right dead smack in the middle of what's going on. Come on. Near them were some bushes where a small predator could easily hide the shepherd grabbed his staff and moved swiftly toward that area. He put his hand to his pocket to reassure himself the sling was still attached and there were a few rocks tucked inside of his belt. And he was ready to go to war for the sheep. Scars of all sizes mocked both of his arms. Some were from predators and some were from stubborn sheep who fought the shepherd's care, not realizing his good intentions. Sadly, shepherds get scars from sheep too. And I tell you, it hurts more when it comes from sheep than it comes from predators. 
Then the shepherd saw it, a snake had crawled out of a hole and was exploring the surrounding outside ground. The shepherd swiftly struck the ground near the hole and the snake darted back inside. Every day he came into that field, the shepherd knew he was risking his life for the sheep. But that was a risk he had decided was worth taking. And Jesus knew when he gave his life for us, he was giving his life for the sheep. And we all, like sheep, have gone astray, every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him, Jesus Christ, the man, the sins of us all. I don't believe that death came to Jesus on the cross by natural causes. I believe it came by a broken heart. Because when the weight of sin hit him, it was more than he could bear. But he loved his sheep. There's a difference in sheep and goat. Goats browse. Sheep graze. Sheep eat the grass and the tops of the grass. Goats, they eat the limbs and everything else around. You got to be careful because if you eat everything the world will give you, you're going to be messed up. Be careful what you watch and be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you put into your system. That's what's going to make up who you are. Hello? And if you're not careful, you'll become a goat who goes around bucking and kicking and snorting and butting heads with everybody and causing problems. If there's one thing the Lord don't like in his church, it's those that sow discord or division in the house of God. And that comes from goats. You won't find lambs doing that. That's a goat. Somebody's running around bucking saying I'm the best or bucking saying I'm the, I'm the worst or bucking saying nobody does me right or everybody does me wrong or poor me or great me. You know, pride comes in two forms. Pride comes like this. I'm the best of everybody. There's another kind of pride too. Nobody loves me around here. Notice the word me in both sentences. Focused on me. And it can sow discord. And goats often sow discord. And Jesus, in his mercy for the sheep, will sometimes kick the goats out. So everybody that leaves ain't a bad thing. Brother Tenney used to say, thank the Lord for blessed subtractions every once in a while. Amen. Actions speak louder than words is a sl slogan we probably all use. One could easily observe how much the shepherd loved his sheep by seeing how much work and effort he put into caring for them. It didn't, did not just tell the sheep, he didn't just tell the sheep that he loved them and then left them to wander aimlessly around. But the good shepherd stays with the sheep, loves the sheep. And the Bible records that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Here's why. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And when you have no shepherd and you're a sheep, you're just in trouble. The Gospels are filled with demonstrations of people doing marvelous works. Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, spent time comforting the lonely and outcasts of society. He ate with sinners, but he didn't become a sinner. But he loved the sinners and wanted to help them come into the light. But most impressive of all is that he died and was buried and rose again. And his motive for all of these things was that he loves the sheep. He didn't have to do it, but he loves us. Lord, give us an understanding of how much you love us because the devil works overtime trying to convince us that you don't love us, but he does. Why would he love me so? David said it like this, what is man that you're even mindful of him or the son of man that thou wouldest visit him? But he did because he loves us. He sees us as sheep having no shepherd. So he, as the good shepherd, makes himself available to us. And if we will humble ourselves and follow, I want to tell you the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you, but the Holy Ghost will not push and shove you anywhere. I promise you this morning, if you don't want to follow Jesus, he won't chase you down. He walked this earth for three and a half years in ministry. 
And I hadn't found a place yet in that Bible where he stopped and told somebody, don't you understand? I'm the only way, the only truth, the only life. He would feed them and they'd leave him. And he wouldn't go grab them and say, don't you understand? Why? Because he's only looking for sheep. He's not interested in carousing people together and whipping them into shape and forcing them to obey. He's not mandating anything of anybody. He says, here's my way, here's my path, here's my ministry, here's my church, here's my desires for your life. Would you like to follow? And so he's just looking for sheep. But it seems as though many need to be convinced. And many who are already saved need to be reminded Fortunately, the Bible contains an exhaustive record of the many things Jesus has already done for us. And even today, the Lord continues to show his love to us in our daily lives. Even this week, I'm sure the Lord has dealt with you or spoke with you or talked with you or reassured you that I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to forsake you. I love you and I'm going to go with you all the way, even to the ends of the world. He's always that good shepherd. When Jesus compared himself to a shepherd, he was essentially making a promise to his followers to nourish, protect, and provide for them. The Lord will take care of his sheep. We don't have to worry about that. The dollar's going to do what the dollar's going to do. Politics is going to do what politics is going to do. The devil's going to do what the devil's going to do. But I've got a feeling for the church, everything's going to be all right. I don't know about the world I don't know about the goats but I got a feeling the sheep are going to be taken care of by the good shepherd our text demonstrates many of the aspects of God's shepherding care for us David himself had spent countless days in the field with his sheep providing for them and protecting them from predators. David killed the lion and the bear before he ever met Goliath. I don't know about you, but I'd be more terrified of a lion and a bear than I would a giant Goliath. That's just me. Maybe you think it differently, but man, a wild animal. But he'd already tested God, and he knew what God could do. He hadn't been to the army at to learn how to use the sword or the shield or the helmet or all that stuff. He hadn't learned how to be a professional warrior, but he knew how to fight the battle. There's a lot of folks who look like they know how to fight because they look religious. But oh, how good it is to have been through the battle with a sickness or a situation or something in your life and watch the Lord make you an overcomer in that situation. And what happens when God does that? You're ready for the next one. Say, well, if he took care of that sickness or he took care of that situation, he'll take care of the next one too. That's why when David saw Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the Lord of Israel? He goes to Saul and says, let me fight him. He says, but you're just a little boy. He said, you don't understand. While you were practicing the sword and the shield on fake stuff, I was out there with a sling on real stuff. And the Lord came through. He said, I whipped the lion. I looked the, whipped the bear. I wonder if Saul believed him. What would you whip him with? This sling and this stone. Well, that ain't even professional armor. We got army tanks. We got airplanes. You got a rock. Yeah, but I got God. You keep your airplanes. You keep your missiles. You keep your bombs. I got Jesus, and he's going to see me through. Amen. David was out protecting those sheep. And then one day David received a, a revelation of himself as a sheep. And God as the good shepherd. David knew what it was like to be a shepherd. But somehow or another it dawned on him, I'm not just a shepherd, I'm a sheep. And thank God I'm a sheep and I have a good shepherd over me. 
and it moved David to write one of the most famous chapters in our Bible. And his words start like this, The Lord is my shepherd. You could stop right there. That'd be enough. The Lord is my shepherd. So devil, you might be looking for me, but I want you to understand I've got a shepherd with me. You might come from the north, you might come from the south, you might come from the east. You might surprise me, devil, but you're not about to surprise my shepherd. And there's something about my shepherd. David couldn't always be with the sheep. But he that watcheth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. I like what Brother Arnold said one time. He said, you stay up worrying all night if you want to, but my God's going to stay up all night watching over me, so I'm going to get a good night's rest. Amen. Hey, if the shepherd's going to stay awake, the sheep can rest and sleep. Everybody say, I got a shepherd. I got a shepherd. Woo, I'm glad I'm a sheep. I've got a shepherd. We have an adversary, the devil. We have all kinds of trials and tribulations, and we have adversity, but we have a shepherd, and he's going to help us. And when we get knocked down, he's going to pick us up. And when we get wounded, he's going to take that bomb of Gilead. He's going to heal us. He's going to rise us back up. He's going to take that rod and that staff and comfort us. Or one preacher say it like this. He said, he comforts us with his rod, and a staff. And the Bible is actually called a rod. Rod means a ruler. That was the name for the Bible when they made it up. The rule of Scripture. The rule of Scripture. It's a rod that guides us. And the staff is God's ministry. His word and his ministry, they protect me and they comfort me. That's his rod and his staff. And the Lord saw, the Lord, David saw the Lord as his good shepherd. David would face difficult times in his life. Some through no fault of his own and others directly caused by his own sinful decisions. But time and time again, God would manifest himself as the perfect shepherd in David's life. And we can be confident that he will be a good shepherd for us also if we'll just make ourselves sheep before God. Humble ourselves before the Lord and He'll take care of us. But if we're hard headed and buck the things of God, buck the ways of God, buck the church of God, buck the ministry of God, notice it's of God. When we buck what God wants in our lives, we're just going to bring ourselves misery and pain. But when we get under the Good Shepherd's staff and rod, it's going to comfort us and guide us and help us. Then David said, I shall not want. I want you to know David knew he would never lack any necessity because the words, I shall not want, are future tense. He didn't say, I have not wanted. He said, I shall not want. He said, I don't know where I'm going to go, what I'm going to go through, but I do know as long as I'm a sheep and he's my shepherd, He's going to take care of everything. Hello? We as children don't realize sometimes what an honor and glorious privilege it is to walk into the kitchen, open the refrigerator, and there's food. If you didn't have that pleasure in your childhood, I'm sorry, but in my life, my mom and my dad both worked to take care of me. They made sure that I was taken care of. I never had to put on clothes that wasn't washed. I never had to eat from a dish that wasn't cleaned. I was fortunate. I was blessed. And that's what the Lord wants to be for us. He wants to take care of our every need. I shall not want. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> The mark of the beast is coming. I can't stop it. But I do know this. I shall not want. Amen. I may lose my job. I can't stop it. But I do know this. I shall not want. 
I might be sick. I don't know where I'm going to go or how I'm going to get up or what's going to happen. Next, but I do know this. I shall not want. For my shepherd is going to lead me to green pastures. He's going to provide for me tomorrow. I shall not want future tense. David had a confidence that not only was there no deficiency now, he said there ain't going to be no deficiency tomorrow either. God's going to take care of it. And when David got ran out of his kingdom by his own son, he's running for his life, not fighting. He's just going away for the people's sake. God took care of it for him. God fought his battles. I reckon David thought, well, if he can handle a lion, he can handle a bear, he can handle a giant, he can handle this too. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. <clears throat> Yet true religion with contentment is great wealth. After all, we did not bring anything with us when we came into this world, and we certainly cannot carry anything with us when we die. Verse 8, so if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. I shall not want. He's going to take care of my necessities. Go to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13 and verse 5 for me. Stay away from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I like that even better. I will never fail you. Tell somebody, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, is my shepherd and he will not fail me. Preacher might fail me. The bank might fail me. The politician's definitely going to fail me. But the Lord will not fail me. He's going to take care of me. God provides food for us both spiritually and physically. God is more than able to provide for our needs in the way he sees fit and knows best. One beautiful promise is that God restoreth my soul, David said. He restoreth my soul. David knew what it was like to have his soul restored. Psalms 51 verse 12. Psalms 51 verse 12 is David's prayer of repentance after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. <clears throat> Here's one part of it. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you, David said. Restore. I don't know about you, but I've needed to be restored a lot in my life. But the Lord is a restorer. I'm so glad God forgives us and then throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. God don't hang it over our head. The devil does, but God don't. If I preach against the sin in this church and you put it under the blood, I'm not preaching to you. I still got to preach against sin. Let the Lord restore your soul. And that's one of the promises of God as a good shepherd. He restoreth my soul. The sheep did not always listen to the shepherd, unfortunately. This resulted in them wandering away and getting lost, getting caught in thickets and falling prey to predators if they're not very careful. And when this happened, the shepherd pursued the lost sheep diligently, hoping to restore the lost sheep. And I know that God loves everybody, but I've just got a belief in my heart that those prodigals, God really wants them back. They belong to him. I say again, sheep are not trying to get away. Sometimes the devil gets into our head and convinces us if something ain't true at all. The devil would love to convince you that church don't really like you. That preacher, he don't like you either. I tell you what, all the church wants is your money anyway. You'd be happy you just stay home. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to get you away from the flock. Because the shepherd's going to stay with the flock. If you leave the flock, it's on you. The shepherd will always stay with the flock and you're going to be a whole lot better off in the end staying in the middle of the flock now I'm going to tell you every sheep's breath don't smell good 
The preacher ain't always going to do it right. Everybody at church ain't going to sing your song or toot your horn. But when you leave the flock, you're going to be in a world of trouble. Because when you get out there, first thing the devil's going to tell you is they never loved you and they don't want you back anyway. I have found that people that leave the church hate the church more than people that don't know anything about it. You know why? Because the devil's screaming at them. They don't love you. They don't want you back. Don't you ever go back to that church. But I've come with news for the devil. We're going to get our prodigals back. We're going to bring our lost sheep back home. Amen? We humans are not always the perfect flock. Rarely a perfect flock. I'm sure the shepherd spends a lot of time pulling us back where we need to be. We have tendencies to be stubborn, think that we know best and go our own way. It says we like sheep have gone our own way. When this happens, we have a merciful, loving shepherd who continues to call out to us with open arms. And I don't know how often you have to repent, but for me, it's pretty often. It may not be something I did, but something I thought or an attitude that I let get a hold of me. And the Holy Ghost say, you need to let go of that attitude. You need to forgive them. Lord, I don't want to do that. But you're right, I do need to. And it ain't just the person on the job. It's the brother or sister across the pew. Let me get where the devil lives. The devil will love to play games with us and mess us up. And you know what? Those people across the pew are going to mess up. But if we're going to do the will of God, we got to forgive each other. For Christ's sake, forgive each other. Pray for one another. Love one another. And by this, we will defeat the devil in our lives. And David continued his psalms. He said, he leadeth me. He leadeth me. He don't push me. He don't drag me. If you got to be drugged to church, I promise you, you won't get drugged to heaven. David said it like this, and we sung it this morning. I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. David one day said, I saw the, the riches of those who were sinful. I saw how much pleasure was in their life. And I said, woe is me until I went to the house of the Lord. Amen. He said, and then I saw the end of the matter and I realized, you know what? They're not better off at all. They may be some popular movie stars, some popular athletes, and some, some filthy rich people in this world. But I wouldn't trade this truth with any of, any of them. Amen. They're not better off than me. On the road of holiness with the Acts 238 one God message, I'm really rich. Amen. I'm glad to be where God has me. We have a merciful, loving shepherd. And David said, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And all the paths of God are righteousness for his name's sake. We do not know the perfect way to take. The Bible says there is a way which seemeth right unto man. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. In other words, people can think they're okay, and they're not. Good people, people that never smoked, never cussed, never drank, never whoremongered, ate right, spit white, did right, can still bust hell wide open. Because all of our goodness is just filthy rags to God. We still got to have the blood of the lamb Amen. to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's a way that seemeth right to man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. But the good shepherd, he can lead us, not in our own way, but in his own way. And sometimes when God leads us, it just don't make no sense. I remember when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He brought them across that, that uh, river, that Red Sea, and he got them on the other side. And, and Moses, the leader, had been out there 40 years. He knew the terrain. And he knew the promised land is that way. Mount Sinai is that way. And God said, let's go 
that way. I don't know if Moses said anything or kept his mouth shut. But I wonder if anybody in the crowd realized Moses were going the wrong direction. If we'd been in my car on vacation and I'm going the wrong way or I've gone too far, at some point my wife say, honey, you're going the wrong way. To which I'd say, honey, I got it. You just keep reading your book. We're going to get there one day. No, I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't. And my wife, she's smart. I, we build stuff and do stuff. Around, and she comes up with stuff, and I'm thinking, man, I'm glad you didn't let me. Sometimes she does it. I, she'll let me do the dumb thing and then say, well, you know, you couldn't. Have, why didn't you say that before I did it? Now I got to take the screw out and pull the wall. I got to pull that back down. And what well, just leave it like this? No, I can't live with it like that now. I know, I know it's wrong. <laughs> Brethren, listen to your wives. Because they'll stare at you knowing that ain't right. But I ain't going to say anything. He'll just get mad. They're right about that too. Lord, forgive us. This wasn't supposed to be marriage counseling. We'll move on. But there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the ends thereof are death. We cannot trust ourselves, brothers and sisters. The ways of God are not hard, but they're not negotiable either. The church is necessary. What a sobering thought a path might look right and good to our eyes, but because we cannot see far enough down the road, we do not know the path ultimately leads to destruction, but our good shepherd does. This is how we take care of it. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. What does that mean? Acknowledge him. Act on your knowledge of God. In other words, whatever decision you got to make, take it to God first. God, I'd make more money if I did this right here. And I want to make more money, God. I'd like to have more money, God. But what do you think about it? Because to me, I'm just a human. All I see is more money. And God looks down and says, well, I see lost kids. I see a lost marriage. I see a broken home. You don't see that, but I do. And all that money ain't going to be worth it when you lose all that stuff. And so God looks like he's being mean to you by saying no, but he's not being mean at all. He's doing you right. Remember, Brother Marlin came to me years ago. He first got in this, and he had an opportunity to go make more money. And at that time, he was young in this truth, and he's grown a lot, and he loves this truth, and I love Brother Marlin. He said, Pastor, he said, I can go here, and I can make a lot of money. I said, is there a Jesus name apostolic church there? He said, no. I said, Brother Marlin, I love you. I said, but don't go. You're too young in this. Don't don't get out there yet. Maybe two years, three years. I don't know. Maybe next month. You. I don't know. But right now, just don't go. Cause the money ain't worth it. What doth it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And worse than that, loses kids. Just ain't worth it. And so God and His goodness doesn't always look good. Because all we see is the dollar signs. God in his goodness takes us ways we really don't want to go. And God in his goodness took that Israel nation to Mount Sinai. Where he could give them his law. So they could cross over. And God's ways don't always make sense. If we're not careful, we'll take our ways and not his. And that will be our destruction. But if in all our ways we will acknowledge him, he'll direct our paths. And there's not many decisions that you can't include God in. Matter of fact, there's no decisions you can't include God in. Lord, should I go this way or that way? Should I buy this or not buy this? Should I do this or not do this? And here's what I want to tell you. If you take God and put him into that decision, 
I'm going to tell you something. If you make a wrong decision, but you're trying to get God's advice and God's decision on it, he'll help you. But if you're stubborn and do your own thing, God will back up and say, that was your decision. You didn't ask my opinion. <laughs> it's always funny when people, people decide what they're going to do and they'll come tell me. So, Pastor, what do you think about what I've decided to do? I say, well, I think you've decided to do it. <laughs> what you mean, what do I think about it? It's not like you care. <laughs> you're not here to ask. Here, Pastor, I'm going to do this. Would you put your blessing on it? No, I don't know if I can or not. If I tell you no, it'll just hurt your feelings. So many times, if we're not careful, we decide what we're going to do, and then we say, now, Lord, bless what I've decided. That's a wrong way to do things, and I've done it as much as you have. But if we're wise, we'll take our decisions to the good shepherd and say, now, shepherd, you see more than I do. Because I might make it, but what if Scott don't make it? What if Devin don't make it? What if Abby don't make it? It won't be worth it. I got to get under the good shepherd and let him lead me the way I should go. Because he's always going to do us right. Even when it appears to be wrong. Got to keep our eyes on the good shepherd at all times. He will lead us to the best directions for each of us because he always knows what's best. The ways of God are not always what one person said. They're not, they're not always pleasurable, but they're always right. He might lead you into a wilderness because you need to be in a wilderness for a while. He might lead you to a dry place because you need to grow some roots. But he's always going to do what's best for you. And though we may not be able to avoid all the trials, we can have somebody go with us. David said it like this. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. To a child of God, death is not evil. Get that out of your mind right now. Blessed in the eyes of God is the death of the saints. He rejoices when his children come home. But when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The darkest valley. We might be tempted then to go astray or to give in to despair because of overwhelming problems that life can seem to bring. Situations too much for us. But what we have to do is that when we're in that valley, remember, I'm never alone. Sometimes if we're not careful, we get our whole focus on our problems. That's why the disciples were fighting for their life in that ship, bailing water. When they looked out across the sea and they saw Jesus walking on the water, they kept fighting for their lives. But Peter said, Lord, if it be you, bid me come. And Jesus said, come. It was an invitation for everybody to step out of the boat. The storm's not going to kill you, Jesus said. I'm here. He's not going to let anything overcome us. He's going to be with us. He's the good shepherd. That's why David said, I'm going to have to walk through the valley sometimes. But fear is optional. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to have to walk through the valley sometimes. Be I a sinner, be I a saint, I'm still going to have to walk through the valley sometimes. But fear is optional. Amen. Amen. I'm going to walk through, but I am not going to fear when I go through. For I've got somebody going with me through that problem. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. David wrote this Psalms in present tense, probably because he was in a dark valley at the time he wrote this. Maybe it was a response to what he was going through. He went through quite a few dark valleys. He had his brothers who didn't believe in him. He had a king that he loved who tried to kill him. 
He committed adultery, and that cost him dearly in his own family, lost his kids. He went through some dark valleys, but he didn't have to be, be afraid because he knew the good shepherd would be with him. From a prison cell, Paul wrote these words, but my God shall supply all. Everybody say all. all. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not your greeds, your needs. Now, we Americans, we've gotten pretty used to greeds. If God got us down to Raymond Noodles, we might not be very happy. But I'm going to tell you, you can live on Raymond Noodles. My wife is living proof. She tells me about how she used to go to school. And her and another girl in the church lived together for a while. And they lived on Raymond Noodles. Lord, please don't make me go there. <laughs> Brother Mix, I still like a good steak and a good burger with some A1 and mustard on it. But you can live on Raymond Noodles. And if God gets you down to Raymond Noodles, he's still supplying your needs. I don't want us to contort the word of God to fit what we want. But let's understand God's going to supply our needs. And Paul, in a prison cell, with his hands chained and his feet chained, says, don't worry, God will supply all your needs. Even if he did not have everything he wanted, he always knew he'd have everything he needed because the good shepherd's always going to take care of the sheep. In order to gain this perspective, we all must build a trusting relationship with God. And when a person gets married, they're in love. But their level of love hasn't really been tested yet. I call it puppy love or infatuation. It's that love before the bills arrive. It's that love that's only seen them after they bathed and shaved and put on perfume. And they just lovely. I just love them. Why you don't get married? I just love them. Do they work? Sometimes, but I just love them. We're going to pray for you. You're going to need it. Infatuation. Anybody else ever been infatuated? I remember as a kid, I got so infatuated with people. <laughs> so the rest of y'all ain't telling the truth. That's all right. We're in church. We'll have an altar call here in a little bit. Every one of y'all thought about somebody or somebody you were infatuated with. He was the best looking. She was, ah. Oh. Anyway, I'm going to tell the truth. I, I'm supposed to. For a relationship to really be a lasting love, you got to get to this level of trust. When you see that old couple who's been through it together, who've paid all the bills and worked and fought, and hated each other one day, loved each other the next, but stayed together and just pursued, went on. And I can tell you something about marriage. You ain't going to love them all the time. It gets really bad. You won't even like them some days. It's like... Mm. <laughs> Let me go back and read that agreement one more time. Make sure for better or for oh, this must be the worst part. <laughs> Lord knew who I was marrying, didn't he? <laughs> but love has stages, and you have to learn to trust. When you're in puppy love. You don't really trust them. You don't know what they're going to do. But after years of them being faithful, going to work and coming home and doing what they're supposed to, and you gain that trust. And if, and if, if they fall and they get back up and they pursue it again, you regain that trust. We have to trust God. Trust comes when you trust God in the bad situations and he comes through. As in any relationship, trust is built over a period of time. Every time God provides for us, we gain a little more confidence that he will provide again the next time. 
This is why after so many years of serving God, Paul, sitting in a prison cell, still had the confidence that God was going to supply all of our needs. This is what David knew God could, why David said he would provide a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Even if he don't take the enemy away, he's still going to take care of us. I wish God would take this away. If he don't take it away, let him feed you in the middle of it. And then David spe specifically said, Thou anointest my head with oil. Ancient shepherds would anoint the sheep's head with oil. This helped to prevent infections and protect them from bugs. Throughout the Bible, anointing is a symbolic demonstration of God's favor and blessing. Those whom God specifically anointed for task were anointed as part of their commission. Go to Acts 10, verse 38. Acts 10 and 38. And no doubt you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Notice he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. How many got the Holy Ghost? You've been anointed. He anoints you with his spirit. Thou anointest my head with oil. And then he says, my cup runneth over. In other words, this is too good, God. This is more than I deserve. I'm just a sheep, but you're a mighty good shepherd. As a much older King David, he would look back and reflect about God's provision. After many years of blessings, protection, provision, and boundless mercy and grace. Remember, Saul lost the kingdom when he sinned. But David, because of his repentant spirit, didn't lose the kingdom. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself will sit on the kingdom and the throne of David. A fallen man. But God let him get back up because he knew I'm a sheep. And I got to get back to the shepherd. David had a new perspective as an older man. He wrote these words. I have been young. And now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He said, I know I can trust him. Because all I've been through already, he's taken care of me. He's provided for me. He's fed me. He's clothed me. He's forgave me. He's picked me back up when I fell down. I was young when it happened, but now I'm old, and he's going to take care of me. David was overwhelmed with how much his heavenly father had cared for him. This little song, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, God, give us a revelation of how much you love us. One song says it like this. I love him because he first loved me. God loves us right now. How easy it is to love someone someone you know loves you. It's not easy to love somebody if you ain't sure they like you yet. You know, that's when you bring the card that says yes, no, or maybe. You smile real big and you think about it. Here I am. Call the number. Oh, hang up. Dial it again. Oh, hang up. I never did call them. I'll never know one. I tried, Brother A. I thought about it. I dialed the number. But before it would ring, I'd hang up. But I've been to Jesus. The good thing about Jesus is I didn't have to call him. He called me. He called me. That's why I love him so. 
Because he called me. Why did he love me so? But thank God I have a shepherd that loves me. And I want to submit to him and do his will. And David closed out his psalm like this. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That was the only logical conclusion. I've got a good shepherd. Why go anywhere else? The Jesus turned to the disciples and says, everybody else is leaving. You guys want to go? And Peter said, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. There's nowhere else to go. I'm going to tell you, when you leave this Jesus name way, there's nowhere else to go. I'm going to put enough doctrine in it. You'll never leave here and go to a Trinitarian church and be happy. I'm going to make sure of it. They might sing about Jesus, but you'd be able to say, Lord, help them know who Jesus is. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In other words, he wanted to be where God was. Why do you love church so much? Because I love God so much. David wanted to live and exist constantly in God's presence. After considering the greatness and the goodness of his shepherd, he determined his only logical opinion or option was to constantly seek to be in God's presence. Let's stand. Thank <laughs> you.